I am. Right. Aren't you thrilled? <laughs> uh, today's passage is Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, and verses 16 through 18. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we are um, on to uh, chapter six as we are making our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so far, we have seen Jesus, let me turn this on, uh, give us the characteristics of what he wants the people of the kingdom of God to be. Um, and it started with the Beatitudes. And over the, the, the last few weeks, we've seen, as Jesus has begun to show us, what true righteousness looks like, and how that contrasts with the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and their view of righteousness. To God, true righteousness is about having a pure heart. It's not about all outward acts of piety. And Matthew 5 ended with Jesus dropping this bomb on the whole conversation, saying, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, again, um, we shouldn't get caught up in how daunting that seems and realize that um, for the, the Greek here, it means to be complete. And it goes back to what Jesus said, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. That it is those of a pure heart that will see God. And so what God is asking, what God wants for us to be complete in him, to function as we are supposed to function, as his unique people in the world. And as we begin chapter 6, he's further expanding on this theme of what it means to truly be righteous and contrast that with the scribes and Pharisees. And a big part of what he's getting into now is, what does it look like to have a pure heart, and how does that play out in, well, everyday life and worship? And what's clear is that as God's people, we will have outward acts. Um, the, it, with, our, our walk with Jesus isn't just a private spiritual thing, but it does play out outwardly in outward works. But the difference between God's people and others, and in the case of the scribes and Pharisees, is the intention behind the work. Um, a while back, there was a terrible television show called Preachers of L.A. It was a reality show that depicted six Los Angeles megachurch preachers, um, and it's everything you wouldn't want in a reality show about pastors. <laughs> they were wearing expensive suits, sporting gold watches and bling. They were driving Porsches and Ferraris and Bentleys. They lived in hilltop mansions with diva wives and fat bank accounts. And one critic of the show said, if you watched it on mute, you would have thought it was about rap stars or rock stars, not pastors. And one thing was clear. The people depicted in this show wanted people to notice them and celebrate them. Now, I can't judge the heart. Only God can do that. But this is far too common a thing with religious people is the desire for the spotlight to be on us and to be celebrated for how holy and righteous we are. And this is what Jesus begins to address in this passage. Have you ever had a friend or an acquaintance 
that it didn't matter the conversation you were having, somehow they always turned a topic towards themselves, their accomplishments, what they were good at, um, or maybe the one-uppers, like, oh, that's a great story, but I got an even better one, <laughs> right? Um, you know those people? If you're around them, it grows old fast, doesn't it? Like, you don't want to be around those people for very long because it comes clear they don't really care about what you have to say. They want your undivided attention and for you to tell them how great they are. And it quickly becomes hard to be around these people. Well, here Jesus is saying it's very easy for us to do the exact same thing spiritually. To do things not for the sake of God, not for the sake of others, but for the sake of the attention and respect it will give us. And so in this passage, Jesus continues to show us what true righteousness looks like. And he lays out a few important things about how we are to operate as his people. And again, this goes back to, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, he is showing us what it means to be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. And the first thing I want to pull out is this. We are to serve without expecting attention. We are to serve without expecting attention. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So one of the marks of the Christian should be our service, right? Uh, our service to God, our service to church, our service to fellow man. As God transforms our heart, it will lead to outward acts of righteousness, of works and service. And Mark 9, verse 35, it says, And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, if anyone will be first, he must be last and be a servant of all. And Jesus is our example in this. We are to serve without expecting attention. Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came to be served, but came to, not to serve, but to, uh, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for the ransom of many. Jesus is our example. He came to serve. Amen. So we are to be a people of service, but, we must watch out for our intentions behind our service. Jesus here says we are to serve without expecting attention. And once again, Jesus is calling out the religious leaders like the Pharisees. What appears to have happened is this, that as these people did their acts of service and their acts of piety, they made sure that they did them in public. They didn't do it in secret. They didn't do it behind closed doors. But they made sure that there were people there to see them do their service and then congratulate them for doing their service and thank them and praise them for what they're doing. And Jesus, who knows the heart, is saying, you're not serving out of a heart of love, but out of a heart of pride. It's not God's love in your hearts that is compelling you to do these acts of righteousness. You're doing them because you're not doing it because you want to help others or because you want to even be close to God, you're doing them so people will like you and respect you for what you're doing. And the harsh truth is, we can do a lot of things in the name of Jesus that aren't really about Jesus. We can do a lot of things in the name of Jesus that Jesus is not actually behind. For In this case, they're, they were about their egos. And so Jesus points us out and says, no, true righteousness it's about serving with no thought to the attention it's going to get you, but it should be about what God is doing in your heart. You should be just as willing to serve whether others see you or not. Amen. And if others see us, we should reflect any attention we get in the praise to God. Amen. And if we're not seen, great, because God sees it. Right. And the scary part of this is Jesus says at the end of verse 1, that if we only serve because we're getting attention, we will have no reward from our Father in heaven. In Luke 14, 11, Jesus says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Mm -hmm. And once again, this goes back to the Beatitudes. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. And this is an example of what being meek and poor in spirit look like. We are to serve without expecting attention. Secondly, we are to give without expecting repayment. We are to give without expecting repayment. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, notice it says when you give to the needy, not if, when. 
do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites, hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father in heaven who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. So once again, like service, Jesus is assuming that his people give to the needy. Um, it should be in our nature to be generous. Luke 6.30, give to anyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Ooh, that's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. The truth is, God, by his nature, is a generous God. I mean, when you truly think about it, what he's given to us, what he's done for us, it should be abundantly clear that he is a gracious and generous God. Amen. And again, Jesus is our example in this. He was selfless with his resources, with his time. He gave his life for our sake. And if we are to be people that reflect him, we are to be generous with what we have been given, recognizing that all that we have been given is from God in the first place and belongs to him. And that should make us be willing to give. So Jesus is assuming his people give. But like service, we can give with the wrong intentions. And Jesus uses some exaggerated language here to kind of drive home his point. He says, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do on the streets to be honored by others. Now, so this is probably not a literal thing, right? Um, there probably weren't literal um, Pharisees out on the street like, do, 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 do. look what I'm doing. I'm giving to the needy, right? Um, but Jesus' point is a lot of people give not because they actually want to help someone, but because they want others to see it and honor them for it. Right. When, <laughs> tax break, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would make sure that when they gave, others were watching. They may not have said anything, but they had made sure it was in public. And in their hearts, they were going, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Tell me how great I'm doing for what I just did. <laughs> and Jesus, who looks at the heart and sees their intention, says, no, that's impurity, not purity. They weren't giving from a pure heart. They were only giving to be repaid in some way. And in this case, it was repayment by honor and prestige. And there are still many people, religious people, who give, and I would say give generously, to a whole lot of different causes but only because they want something back in return. Maybe they see it as an investment that will pay out later. Maybe they see it as a way to earn favor or gain power with others because, hey, I gave, now I'm owed something. Maybe like the Pharisees, it's a way to gain <coughs> respect and admiration of others. I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard from my colleagues about um, fairly wealthy people and congregations that when something goes wrong, their first threat is, well, I'll stop giving. And I know how much I give, and if I stop giving, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. But Jesus says, if you give because you're wanting and expecting repayment, you've missed the point. That's right. And he says that people, give, uh, people who give only because of what they'll gain it back says, they've already received their reward. And their reward isn't from God, but instead Jesus says this, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says, don't give in order to get attention. In fact, let no one see it. Don't tell people because as you give, my people are supposed to give of hearts full of love, not because they're being rewarded by others. He says, your goal as my follower should be to please me. And when you give for the sake of others, and because you love me with no thought what you're getting out of it, I'm pleased with you, and I will reward you in turn. Amen. So this should cause us to question some things in ourselves of, who do I truly want approval from? God or man? What do I truly want to please? Do I want... Um, to please God, or do I want to please myself? Galatians 1.10, Paul says, Am I seeking the approval of man or God? 
or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Proverbs 21, or 29, 25 says, the fear of man light lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. My prayer is that we would follow Christ's example, that we would be a giving and generous people, but that we would do it from a heart of love and compassion for others, Amen. not what we are getting out of it. But we give because we are compelled to do so by the Spirit of God in us. He says, don't draw attention to it, but know I am pleased with you and I will reward you. Amen. And this can be so tough. Because we live in such a give-take society, especially when it comes to giving, don't we? Like, everything's an investment. I want to know what, that my money's going to work for me, right? <laughs> but I think the question that, that should be asked at the end of the day is, is my money giving an internal return? Good. Am I giving to God in a way that can actually build his kingdom? Amen. Thirdly, we are to seek God without expecting honor. We are to seek God without expecting honor. So if you drop down to verse 16, I, I brought 16 through 18 in here because it kind of kept with the, the theme of, uh, of today. In verse 16, it says, when you fast, notice it says when. We don't like that one very much in this society, do we? <laughs> we don't fast very often. Maybe we should. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. So in this example, he addresses another act of piety, fasting. And for the religious elite in Jesus' day, fasting would have been common and a regular occurrence. And apparently what these people were doing is when they fasted, they made sure everybody knew they were fasting. They put on ratty clothes, they didn't shave, they didn't do anything with their beards, and so you walked by them and you could just tell they were denying themselves, right? But Jesus says here is essentially, yes, they are denying themselves food, but they're actually indulging themselves in attention and honor. They are denying themselves food, but they are indulging their egos by drawing attention to the fact that they're fasting. And once again, they have missed the point. Fasting should be about drawing near to God and seeking him. But Jesus, who again sees the heart, says, they're not really seeking me, they're seeking their own honor. They want people to pass by them and see their faces and see their clothes and go, oh wow, you're fasting. You must be so holy and righteous, good job. You must be so close to God for denying yourself this and, and doing this. But like all the other things we've talked about today, Jesus says, I'm not pleased with that because it's about their egos. It's not about me. Once again, he see, says, they have already received their reward in full. The praise and honor that they get for fasting in this manner is all the praise and reward they're going to get. Right. They're not drawing closer to me. They're not seeking me. And Jesus tells us how to fast if we want to do it right. He says, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it's not obvious to others you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And he who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. He says, don't draw attention to yourself. But if you want to seek me, seek me. Don't use acts of piety to try to honor yourself, but seek God because you want to seek God. Seek his guidance because you actually want his guidance. And again, when we seek God for who he is because we want him and we love him, he says, we will be rewarded even if no one else gives us kudos for what we're doing. Because he will be pleased with us when we seek him with pure intentions. Uh, Mark Twain told a story about a well-known businessman who he encountered, and this uh, businessman began to brag. He said, before I die, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I'm going to climb Mount Sinai, and I'm going to read the Ten Commandments as loud as I can. Mark Twain said, I have a better idea. <laughs> How about you stay here and actually do them? <laughs> what everything in this section reveals to us 
is that when we make our faith about us and our glory and getting attention and honor, we have missed the point. And the truth is, when we miss a point like that, the only reward we, we're getting is when people pat us on the back and say, good job. We are getting no reward from God for those. But what true faith and true righteousness looks like is not living for our glory at all. It's living for God's glory. We should be far more concerned with, getting God, with giving God, God glory than us receiving glory. We should be far more pleased when God is praised than when we get praised. And Jesus said earlier in this sermon, in chapter 5, um, we looked at a couple weeks ago, he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Notice he said that they may see your good works, but who's getting the glory? God is, Amen. not us. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. So this whole section is Jesus telling us what our righteousness, the, the type of righteousness that surpasses the scribes and Pharisees. He's showing us what it looks like. They were pious. They did a lot. They served a lot. They gave a lot. But what Jesus reveals here is while they did all those things, and they were honored by others, he says, their hearts were far from me. He says, I was not pleased with what they did. Why? Because it was about them. It wasn't about me. And we must be careful and vigilant to do the same. Amen. So before we leave, a um, couple questions for us to consider this week that I think would be really worthwhile for us to consider um, and be honest with ourselves about. The first one is, am I willing to serve if no one ever notices what I do? Am I willing to serve if no one ever notices what I do? I think for many of us, this is probably harder than we think. Because um, you know what? I like it when people pat me on the back and say, good job. I like it when people say, hey, I saw that. You're doing great. Thanks. <laughs> but our purpose is to glorify God, not ourselves. I'm not saying that all praise is bad because sometimes we need encouragement. But that shouldn't be why we're doing things. And so we must learn to be content knowing that God sees us even if no one else does. Amen. Second one, are you willing to give to those in need even if I get nothing in return? Amen. Am I willing to give even if I get nothing in return? Sometimes this is a struggle, um, even in like uh, church programs and stuff like that. Um, and I, as I've talked to colleagues and stuff, a lot of times it's, we do this thing for the community, we feed them, whatever, and no one ever comes to church out of it. Should we stop doing it because no one ever comes to church because of this thing we're doing? And our answer should be no. We keep doing it. Why? Because we are demonstrating the love of God. We're not getting something out of it, but we are letting God work through us. We must be willing to give even if we get nothing back. And if the answer is no, I'm not, then we may need to ask God to help increase our love for him and for others. And then thirdly, probably the most important question, what do I want more? God's praise or man's praise? What do I want more? God's praise or man's praise? And if, again, I think our first answer to this question is obvious. Well, of course I want God's praise. But the more that I think about this, I think the harder it gets. Because we want to be liked. We want others to notice us. We want to receive praise. And our desire for those things can sneakily begin to grow and grow. Especially when we are doing godly things <laughs> and receiving honor and praise for those things. But at the end of the day, God is more than enough for us. Because the truth is, only God can satisfy the longing that our hearts and souls have. Amen. And when we truly desire God over everything else, we will serve him because we love him. We will have joy and peace and all the things that we truly long for. And we will have the gratification of knowing that our Heavenly Father is pleased with us. Amen. And knowing that he is pleased with us 
should be all of the approval we ever need. And if it's not, we must search our hearts and root those things out. And so my prayer today is truly that we would have a righteousness that surpasses the scribes and Pharisees, that we would have outward acts of righteousness, but it would come from a pure heart because Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you, God, that you are enough for us. And so, Lord, I pray that as individuals and as a church, God, I pray you would increase our, our service and our giving and all those outward acts, Lord, but may they come from a pure heart. And so, Father, I invite you today to search us, to search our hearts and our souls and our minds, and God, reveal the places in our lives where maybe we have been doing things in your name, but our intention has been about our name. And so, Father, search us, convict us, and God, may you create in each and every one of us a pure heart. May we hunger and thirst for what true righteousness is. And may we truly be reflections of who you are. Lord, as we dismiss and as some of us go, but as others stay and enjoy a meal together, I pray that you would bless each one, that you would bless the conversation around these tables and bless the food to our bodies. And I pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, we invite you to stay and enjoy a potluck with us. Um, even if you did not bring anything, you are welcome to stay. Um, so I invite you to eat and um, have a blessed rest of the day. You are dismissed.